grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for this Monday, Thursday, is our epistle reading we had just before, which comes from the 11th chapter of St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, verses 23 through to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is give, broken and given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after the supper, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and said, Drink of it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. In Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, he records the words of institution, as he had been taught them and as he had taught them to the congregation. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, St. Paul confesses that they blessed the bread and wine for Holy Communion prior to distribution. And here Paul now records the words of that blessing. The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after the supper, and said, This is my blood of the new covenant, do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Now the keen observer will notice that this version of the words of institution is lacking some of the words used in the version that we use on Sunday Divine Service. The words of institution which we use in our Sunday Divine Service are made up of a compilation from Matthew, Mark, Luke and 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is the only version to use the words the Lord on the night when he was betrayed. This is because the Gospel writers gave the words of institution in the middle of a historical discourse detailing the night on which Jesus was betrayed, whereas Paul is speaking the words of institution in a liturgical sense and thus provides a preface for his hearers. Now the next line, that Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, is found in all four accounts, although with a slight difference. Matthew and Mark both say that Jesus blessed the bread, while Luke and Paul say that Jesus gave thanks. Is this a contradiction in the scriptures? No, and for several reasons. Firstly, this sentence is not part of the words of Jesus. This is still part of the historical explanation of what Jesus is doing. Matthew and Mark are saying that Jesus is blessing the bread, while Luke and Paul are saying that Jesus is giving thanks for the bread. The authors are saying what happened in their own words. Secondly, this is not a contradiction because blessing and giving thanks are not two different things. By giving thanks, Jesus was blessing the bread. We can see this when we compare 1 Corinthians 10 with 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul speaks of giving thanks over the bread and doing likewise with the cup, thus giving thanks for the cup also. But in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul speaks of this action as blessing the cup of blessing, demonstrating to the reader that blessing and giving thanks are just two different ways of saying the same thing. Likewise, Matthew and Mark both say that Jesus blessed the bread, but he gave thanks over the cup, demonstrating that these two terms are synonymous. The breaking of the bread was done for the purpose of distribution, although the act of breaking the bread took part in, in part of the blessing of the bread. For in 1 Corinthians 10.16, we see St. Paul speak of blessing the cup and breaking the bread. The breaking of the bread is here paralleled alongside the blessing of the cup. 
Now the first main difference with 1 Corinthians is that St. Paul does not say that Jesus gave the bread. Matthew, Mark and Luke all mention Jesus giving the bread. Paul does not feel it is necessary to say that Jesus gave the bread to his disciples, though the reader would logically assume that this is exactly what Jesus did with it. The next difference in the text is the line, take and eat. Matthew's Gospel says take and eat, while Mark simply says take. Luke does not even include this line, as there is debate over whether Paul included this line or not. Some Greek manuscripts, such as those used in the Texas Receptors, include the line, take and eat, in 1 Corinthians 11. Whereas more modern manuscripts, based on higher, critical, higher textual criticism, does not include this line, arguing that the earliest manuscripts lack the line, take and eat, in 1 Corinthians. Based on the fact that Luke and Paul have very similar words of institution, and Luke was a colleague and disciple of Paul, it would be more likely that Luke learnt his version of the words of institution from St. Paul. And so if Luke does not include take and eat, it would be more likely that Paul didn't either, rather than Luke choosing to omit this phrase and ha after having learnt it from Paul. Regardless of whether Paul's version contained these words, Matthew's version does. And so we know that Jesus did indeed say the words take and eat. In these words, Jesus is giving clear instructions to the church about what we are to do with the consecrated bread. The church is not to parade the bread around, or store it in a cupboard, or throw it in a bin or on the ground. No, Jesus tells us exactly what to do. Take this bread and eat it. Now the next phrase in the words of institution is one that all four of the authors agree upon. This is my body. None of the authors forget to include these words. This phrase, along with its partner, this is my blood, are the most important words in the words of institution, upon which the rest of the words hang. This statement instructs the hearers that this bread is not ordinary bread, but this bread is the very body of Christ. How? Well, that is a great mystery. What we know is that this bread is the body of Christ, for is means is, and Jesus says that it is. And this is just, and this isn't just, and this isn't just anybody. This body isn't some abstract substance. It is the very body of Christ, broken and given for you. The body in the bread is the very body of Christ hanging on the cross transcending space and time to be present in this consecrated bread. The body that the disciples consumed that night is the very same body that we consume today. For each of us is partaking of the crucified body hanging on the cross, transcending back in time to the disciples at the Last Supper and transcending forward in time to us in our supper today. Jesus is God, omnipresent and omnitemporal, everywhere and every when. And Jesus is also man, and through the communion of attributes, his human body partakes in the attributes of his divine nature. His body is able to be everywhere and every when. And Jesus has promised that whenever his words are united with the elements of bread and wine for the purpose of distribution and consumption, his body and blood are present there. One difference between the different authors is the phrase given for you. Matthew and Mark do not include this line at all. Luke's gospel has given for you, and Paul's epistle is a debated topic. In the Texas Receptus, the line in the epistle is broken for you. And this is how you read it in the English King James Version and Luther's German Bible. But the Latin Vulgate of St. Jerome reads it as given for you. And modern manuscripts, based on the higher criticism method, argue that the original Greek lacked either broken or given and simply reads, My body which is for you. If we follow the Texas Receptus, then Luke's Gospel has given for you and 1 Corinthians has broken for you. And so what did Jesus actually say? Is this a contradiction in the text? Well, Martin Luther had a very simple rule of thumb when it came to questions like these. He held that the scriptures are inerrant and infallible. If Luke said Jesus said given and Paul said Jesus said broken, both are true. 
Thus, if Jesus, if Luke says Jesus says given and Paul says Jesus said broken, then obviously Jesus must have said both, broken and given for you. Although, even though Luther's German Bible has given for you in Luke and broken for you in 1 Corinthians, Luther's Catechism and Luther's Order of Service for the German Mass only have given for you. This is most likely because Luther was following the Western tradition, for in the Western tradition the words of institution only ever had given for you. This is most likely due to the fact that the Western Church followed the Latin Vulgate, which has given for you in both Luke and 1 Corinthians, and never says the word broken for you. The Eastern Church, however, follows a different tradition. In the East, the words of institution always read broken for you. However, the Eastern Church only has broken for you, not broken and given for you, demonstrating that the two terms may be synonymous. The important point here is that Paul and Luke both declare that this bread is given for you. The you here refers to the people gathered for communion. This body in this bread is for those who are gathered here to consume it. Now the next phrase is, do this in remembrance of me. This phrase also only appears in Luke and 1 Corinthians and not in Matthew or Mark. Here, Jesus commands his disciples to continue this practice. They too were to bless bread and distribute the body of Christ in that bread. The next phrase that we have in our version of the words of institution is, In the same way he took the cup after the supper and when he had given thanks. This is a compilation of the different versions of the scripture. Matthew and Mark both say that Jesus took a cup and gave thanks, while Luke and Paul say that in the same way Jesus took the cup. Luke and Paul didn't feel the need to repeat themselves and explicitly say that Jesus gave thanks over the cup. Instead, they simply say that Jesus did with the cup just as he had done with the bread, implying that he gave thanks over this cup. Now, as mentioned above, Matthew and Mark say that Jesus blessed the bread and gave thanks over the cup, demonstrating that the two words are indeed synonymous. Next, Matthew and Mark say that Jesus gave the cup and said, while Luke and Paul simply, said, simply say that Jesus said, as Paul had done with the bread, so he did with the cup, and felt no need to explicitly mention that Jesus gave the cup, as it assumed that this is what he did with the consecrated cup. Matthew, then, is the only one of the four to mention the explicit command of Jesus to drink from the cup. The other authors lack this, assuming that it would be obvious to the, reader, to the reader that Jesus intended for the disciples to drink from the cup. This is especially the case with Luke and Paul, who said that Jesus did with the cup the same thing that he had done with the bread. Jesus had commanded the disciples to eat the bread, and so in the same way he commanded the disciples to drink the cup. Luke and Paul didn't feel a need to repeat themselves. All four authors then agree on the next line. This is my blood of the new covenant. Just as it was, so, was important to know that the bread was the very body of Christ, in the same way, it is important for the hearer to know that this isn't just ordinary wine, but in, with, and under this wine is the very blood of Jesus. And not just any blood, but this is the blood of the new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, God had a promise. God had promised the Israelites that when the Messiah would come, he would establish a new covenant. Not a covenant like the one that God had had with the Israelites, which they broke, but a new covenant in which God would forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The old covenant was a covenant of the law. Keep God's law and receive eternal life. Something that we could not achieve. The new covenant is a covenant of gospel. Jesus doing all the work. See, the old covenant requires perfect obedience which man cannot do. But Jesus, the God-man, came to fulfill the law on our behalf. He was able to fulfill the old covenant through his perfect obedience.
Jesus then establishes a new covenant in his blood. His blood, shed on the cross, paid the debts that we owed and won for us the forgiveness of our sins. Through Holy Communion, we now partake in that covenant, in which the law is already fulfilled and our debt is already paid. In Holy Communion, we receive the forgiveness of our sins and the righteousness of Christ. By entering into this new covenant, we make the old covenant obsolete. Because through the new covenant, we have fulfilled the old covenant. See, the old covenant demanded absolute perfect obedience in order for us to enter into heaven. But the new covenant says, give your sins to Jesus and Jesus will give you his righteousness. Through the new covenant, you have the perfect obedience of Christ. And thus, in God's eyes, you have already fulfilled the old covenant. For you are now one with Christ. His fulfilling of the law is your fulfilling of the law. And the next line is another point of difference between the different versions of the words of institution. Matthew and Mark say that Jesus shed his blood for many, that is, for all. While Luke says that Jesus shed his blood for you, that is, the communicants. Paul mentions neither. Here, we have the same issue that we mentioned before. What did Jesus actually say for you or for many? Again, if we say that scripture is true, and Matthew and Mark say that Jesus says many and Luke says you, then the answer is Jesus must have said both. And this has been the historic position of the church. In the early church, the words of institution read, shed for you and for many. Unlike the words given and broken, in which the West said given and the East said broken, both East and West have agreed to say for you and for many. This is still the wording used in the Roman Church, the Eastern Orthodox, the Anglicans and in some Lutheran churches. The wording of for you and for many was how the words of institution appeared in Luther's 1523 Wittenberg Order and Luther's 1526 German Mass. It is also how it appeared in the 1555 Danish Communion service. As we entered into the 1800s, there is a parting of ways in Lutheranism, in which churches who belonged to the General Synod and the General Council kept the tradition and continued to use for you and for many, whereas the churches of the Synodical Conference only ever used for you, as it appears in Luther's Catechism, rather than how it appeared in Luther's Liturgical Orders. The theological significance of for you and for many is that Jesus' body and blood is shed not just for the church, but for all people. Similar to how we read in 1 John 2.2, 2, that Jesus is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Likewise, Jesus shed his blood for us, and not for us only, but for the whole world. What is interesting to note here is that Jesus said concerning the bread given for you, but with the blood Jesus shed for you and for many. Jesus does not say for many when he gives the bread. This does not mean that Jesus didn't die for all, but that the body of Jesus is not given to all. See, the blood of Jesus is shed for all. It is only given to those who believe. But as we read in the next section of 1 Corinthians 11, those who eat and drink in a worthy manner eat and drink to eternal life, but those who eat and drink in an unworthy manner eat and drink damnation upon themselves. Therefore, the body and blood is shed for you, but only given to those who repent of their sins and believe that in this bread and wine is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for the forgiveness of sins. The fact that Jesus said that his body is shed for all, but that his body is only given to the church, demonstrates the principle of closed communion and rejects the practice of open communion. The next phrase for the words of institution is for the forgiveness of sins. This line is only ever mentioned in Matthew's Gospel. This does not mean that the others did not teach that the Lord's Supper gave the forgiveness of sins, but they didn't feel the need to explicitly say this. 
possibly because they had already said that the blood is the blood of the new covenant. And, say, and the prophet Jeremiah taught that the new covenant was for the forgiveness of sins. Thus the term new covenant implies that Holy Communion gives the forgiveness of sins. But just so we weren't confused about the purpose of Holy Communion, Jesus does add this line, for the forgiveness of sins, which thankfully Matthew felt necessary to include for us. And lastly, Jesus said, Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As it was with the bread, so it was with the cup. This practice was not a once-off invite but was something that the disciples were commanded to do, to continue to do. But Paul gives a bit more information. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Here Jesus is telling us that this communion meal would not be an annual event like the Jewish Passover, but something that we would do often. This does not mean that we have to celebrate Holy Communion often, as if it was a law that we have to have a weekly or daily communion. Instead, Jesus is assuming that we would want to do this often. And how often were we to celebrate that? As often as we gathered to remember him. In the end of Acts 2, we read how the Christians in Jerusalem gathered daily for Holy Communion. But when we get to Acts 20, we see how the Christians at Troas were having weekly communion, gathering every Sunday. There is no law how often we must have Holy Communion. For communion is not a work, but a gift. How often should we have communion? The question is, how often do you want it? And to answer that, how often do you need it? And the answer to that is, how often do you sin? For as often as you sin is as often as you need to receive the forgiveness of your sins through Holy Communion. There is no law how often you need to partake of Holy Communion. But it is a gift of God which dispenses grace and the forgiveness of sins. And so why would you not want to have it as often as possible? In the Lutheran Confessions, the Reformers confess that we continue to celebrate Holy Communion every Sunday and every feast day. Whenever the church gathered together to remember the Lord, the reformers offered Holy Communion. Therefore, let us have communion as often as we can. For God knows that we need it daily, if not more. And the final question that one might ask when comparing the words of institution is what words are needed to make the sacrament valid? Matthew, Mark, Luke and Paul all had different versions. Paul's version used in 1 Corinthians is a liturgical version and was the one used in the Pauline congregations for the rite of Holy Communion. Yet Paul's version differs to those of the Gospel writers. Paul doesn't include everything they say. And the version we use today in our rite of Holy Communion is a compilation of all four versions. Paul, Mark and Luke don't even mention that Holy Communion is given for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew alone mentions this. St. Paul didn't say everything we say, and yet he considered his version to be a valid consecration of the elements, and considered the differences between church traditions. As I mentioned before, the West and the East differ on whether you say given or broken. Some Lutherans have for you, and some Lutherans have for you and for many. What words are necessary? Well, historically the church has held that the eight words, this is my body, this is my blood, were used, when used, are a valid sacrament. In the 1100s, the scholastic theologian Peter Lombard argued that Holy Communion was valid as long as one said, this is my body and this is my blood. And in the 1400s, Pope Eugene IV at the Council of Florence established that communion would be valid as long as the words, this is my body and this is my blood were spoken over bread and wine. This was based on the teaching of the church father, St. John Chrysostom, who said, saying, this is my body, makes the sacrifice complete at every table in our churches. Martin Luther appears to have agreed with this decision, teaching that 
When we say, this is my body, then it is his body. This decision of the church is based on two chief principles regarding the words of institution in scripture. And the first principle is consensus. <clears throat> the first is consensus. All four writers of the all four biblical writers include the words this is my body, this is my blood, demonstrating that these words are essential in our rite of Holy Communion. If we were to compare all four versions of the words of institution in Scripture, the word which everyone agrees upon is that Jesus took bread and gave thanks or blessed it, broke it and said, This is my body, and then took a cup and gave thanks and said, This is my blood of the new covenant. These are the words upon which all four authors deemed necessary to include. Paul says nothing about giving the bread. Luke and possibly Paul also never mention the command to take and eat. Matthew and Mark do not mention that the bread is given for you, or that we should do this in remembrance of Jesus. Luke and Paul do not explicitly mention that Jesus gave thanks over the cup, although they do imply it when they say the line in the same way. But Mark, Luke and Paul don't mention the command to drink the cup, nor say that the blood of Jesus is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew and Mark say that the blood is for many, and Luke says for you, and Paul doesn't even mention this. Yet Paul alone mentions that we should do with this cup as we should do this with the cup as often as we drink it in remembrance of Jesus. The only thing that all four gospel writers mention is that Jesus blessed the bread and the cup and declared it to be his body and his blood. And this then leads us to the second principle regarding which words are necessary. And that is the principle of the power of the words of Christ. See, God's word is powerful and is able to do whatever God says. God says, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus says, get up and walk, and a lame man is able to get up and walk. Therefore, when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, then it is his body, it is his blood. When Jesus tells us, to take and eat or to take and drink, these words do not bring about the real presence. These words are merely the command to us to, of Christ to tell us what we should do with this bread and this wine. Eat it and drink it. When Jesus tells us that this bread or wine is given for us and that it is for the forgiveness of our sins, these words do not bring about the presence of the real presence. These words are simply the promise of Jesus as to why we are given this body and this blood in this bread and this wine. Jesus tells us to do this in remembrance of him. These words do not bring about the real presence. These words are just the command of Christ to repeat this sacramental meal again and again. But when Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, it is his body, it is his blood. In those eight words, that makes ordinary bread and wine into bread and wine united with the body and blood of Jesus. Thus, when we consecrate the Lord's Supper, the only words that are absolutely necessary are, this is my body and this is my blood. For it is in those words, when spoken by the pastor in the place and stead of Christ, that unites this ordinary bread and wine with the very body and blood of Christ. And as Luther taught, it is essential that the pastor says, this is my body, and not this is Christ's body. For as Luther taught, the pastor has no power in himself to unite the body of Christ with this bread. The pastor has no power to simply declare this or that bread to be the body of Christ. But when the pastor in the stead of Christ speaks the very words of Christ, this is my body, then it is his body. For here the pastor does not speak by his own authority, but he speaks in the place of Christ as Christ's mouthpiece. Yet one may ask, if only those eight words are necessary to make the sacrament valid, then why do we say the other words at all? Firstly, why not say them? Christ has revealed these words to us in his holy scriptures, so why not speak the words that he has kindly given to us? Secondly, even though these words are not necessary for the consecration, that does not mean they are not valuable. 
the other words of institution provide us with both the command and promise of Christ. These words give us the command to eat the body and blood of Christ, which is in, with and under the consecrated bread and wine. These words give us the command to repeat this meal again and again. And these words provide us with the promise of Christ of why we consume this sacramental meal. Because in this bread and in this wine is the body and blood of Christ given to you for the forgiveness of your sins. It is one thing to know that the bread and the wine are the body and blood of Christ. But we also need to know what to do with them and why we do it. Take. Eat. This is the body of Christ broken and given for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ, of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.